If there is one Halo level which exemplifies the expression, out with the old, in with the new, it is without doubt Halo 4's third mission, Forerunner, introducing a new faction to tackle, a new set of weapons to get to grips with, and a new antagonist to thwart, it marks the true beginning of the transition from Bungie developed Halo to 343 Industries developed Halo. Forerunner begins abruptly. What were those things? Some sort of advanced defense AIs. Related to the Sentinels, I'm guessing, but it's hard to say without a closer look. Come on, let's figure out where that transit system dumped us. Those things in question being the Prometheans you first encountered moments ago at the end of Requiem. Your task now is to prevent the UNSC Infinity from being sucked towards the Shield World by the Gravity Well, which did the same to you earlier. Those beams coming off it are creating the interference we've been experiencing. We'd have to take them out to contact Infinity. Can you get us there? Opening a gate to the first beam pylon. Pull me, and let's go. Arriving in a barren, rocky landscape, the first pillar you need to destroy looms in the distance, but there is definitely trouble afoot which needs to be dealt with first. The quadrupeds which scuttle out of sight momentarily before they begin climbing down walls to attack are known as crawlers, and they will soon be joined by knights as well as watchers which spawn from them. Collectively, these three enemy types make up the new Promethean faction you'll be battling a whole lot during 4, and in my view, they are the worst in the franchise. I'll I'll try to run through all my issues with them as succinctly as possible to avoid this turning into an hour-long moan fest, so do bear with me for a jiffy. The biggest problem the Prometheans have is a lack of personality, and I don't just mean in terms of them not having their own voice. That is an issue, but it is in a way understandable. Jumping ahead to Master Chief meeting the Librarian during Reclaimer, it transpires that while each knight was created using a human's neural pattern, they're essentially designed to be robotic warriors with no free will of their own. That machine-like construction, their mechanical nature, is great for their original purpose of countering the Flood. They can't, after all, be turned upon death, and lore-wise they have potential, but none of that makes for great combat. Prometheans don't really react when you shoot them, they don't much emote, and in general they lack any kind of personality whatsoever. The same argument could, of course, be made of the Flood, but they nonetheless had a certain unsettling aura around them, while Four's new enemy leaves me just as emotionless as they themselves are. They usually appear out of thin air and disappear just as quickly when defeated, and in between they never make you feel anything. A grunt fleeing in terror makes you feel powerful, a brute going berserk makes you feel panicked, a horde of flood closing in on you makes you feel petrified. The Prometheans, nothing, which is a shame, as they had potential to be much creepier than they ended up being. Aesthetically, it's the same story. Not only do they look like generic sci-fi automatons, but their design is in keeping with the Forerunner environments themselves. It's not a big deal at this stage, but towards the end of the level, and for much of the rest of Halo 4, it certainly is, as the last thing you want from an already frustrating faction is for them to blend into many of the areas within which you encounter them. I'd hoped to never have that issue again with the series after the mess that was 3's Cortana, but hey-ho, here we are. Continuing that theme, discerning enemy types is a tough task too, as different units of the same type aren't visually distinct from one another. You might be scrapping with a Crawler Prime as opposed to a Crawler, the first has spikes on its back, the second does not. Or a Knight Commander instead of a Knight, the first has a bit more yellow on its back. But it's difficult to tell as the visual language used to denote rank has been reduced massively compared to earlier titles. The difference between ranks of elites, grunts and the like in Bungie's efforts were always incredibly obvious. Not so much in Halo 4, you'll likely not even realise half the time that one Promethean type differs from another. Finally, they're exasperating to actually fight. Crawlers are by far and away the least offensive of the bunch. A pack enemy which can move across areas with great speed and are able to scale walls, they provide a challenge in the mould of drones but are more entertaining to tackle. Their health pool, or the number of them which appear at a time, could probably stand to be lowered somewhat, and they can be a huge pain if they manage to get behind you, but they provide a unique enough challenge. 
Knights, if you'll excuse the pun, are <clears throat> a nightmare, as 343 has loaded them up with so, so many infuriating abilities. They are bullet sponges, especially on higher difficulties, with shields you might not even realise you've broken at times, such as the lack of effect. They're able to teleport to safety after taking damage, they're often equipped with weapons which can kill you in an instant, and even when you've offed one, there's still the potential for it to be revived by a Watcher. Spread those many talents across several different types of Promethean, and you'd have a varied cast which required different tactics depending on the enemy squad's makeup. Combine them all into one dreadful package, and to be frank, it makes for an absolutely excruciating experience. Watchers are the worst of the bunch, and they too come packed to the gills with irritating tricks. Among others, they can shoot you, catch grenades and throw them back at you, shield allies, and as mentioned, they can resurrect knights. All of that would at best be manageable, however, if not for the cherry on the icing of a cake made entirely out of raw sewage, which is that they can fly, they are incredibly nimble, and will actively hide when they take damage. They are the worst enemy in Halo, hands down. Put together, the Prometheans encourage a playstyle which is completely at odds with what the series should be about. So many describe Halo's combat as a dance, and that's what it should be, as you weave in and out of cover and circle arenas. With the Prometheans, there's no dance. 99% of the time, the optimal strategy is to sit at a distance and treat their ranks as particularly annoying shooting galleries. Running headfirst into battle and using your wits to survive, a risky but enjoyable plan of attack previously, will nearly always end in tears. Keeping a safe distance and chipping away at their ranks while slowly advancing instead makes skirmishes with them about as pain-free as they're ever going to be. Moving on, after destroying three power cores to bring down the shield protecting the first pylon, Master Chief disables it and returns to the starting area via a portal. There, the Covenant make their presence known. I was wondering why Infinity hadn't encountered the Covenant yet. What are they doing here? They're heading to the second pylon as well. That can't be a coincidence. After heading through another portal which brings you closer to the second pylon, Forerunner begins to up the intensity with Covenant and Prometheans duking it out. Let's now talk about the Promethean weapons. Along with your recently introduced adversary, there is a brand spanking new set of six Forerunner guns and a grenade on offer. That may sound like nothing out of the ordinary, shooter sequels do tend to include new firearms, but it's actually a sizeable change to the series sandbox. In every other Halo title you could choose from either human or covenant armaments, with each having their own strengths. Human weapons tend to hit their target instantly, you can pick up extra ammo for them but consequently have to reload, and they do more damage to unshielded enemies. By comparison, Covenant weapons primarily use projectiles, meaning your shots have travel time between you and your target, they finite ammo but don't need to be reloaded, although some can overheat if fired too rapidly, and they're better at bringing down an opponent's shields than killing them outright. As the franchise has progressed, more and more exceptions to those rules have emerged, but to this day, that remains their original intent. As a result, the best Halo loadouts usually always featured one of each. The most infamous example is the so-called noob combo, popularised way back when in Combat Evolved, a Covenant plasma pistol and a human precision weapon, most likely the pistol. The first allows you to quickly deplete shields before the second ends the fight moments later with a headshot. You'd assume, then, that Promethean weapons being a third group would usher in a seismic sandbox shift, but surprisingly, that doesn't end up being the case at all. Very sensibly, 343 gives you time to become accustomed to everything new available early on. Granted, you begin Forerunner with a pistol and an assault rifle, but you will run out of ammo for them and have no choice but to grab a gun or two from the many fallen Prometheans, complete with gorgeous animation when you first pick them up. What you'll soon come to realise, though, is that there's actually not a whole lot to acclimatise to, although there is a reason for that. Putting to one side the incineration cannon, which doesn't appear during Forerunner, you can try out five of the six new weapons during the mission. For all intents and purposes, the bolt shot is the new pistol, the suppressor is a new SMG, the scatter shot is a new shotgun, the light rifle is a new battle rifle or carbine, and the binary rifle a new sniper rifle. Most have extra functions which make them more distinct, being able to use the bolt shot as a shotgun by charging it is my favourite, with the light rifles unscoped burst and scoped single shots being a close second, but none are 
different enough from those which already exist that they change your playstyle, like carrying human or covenant weapons have always done. The pulse grenade can pretty much be ignored entirely, honestly. It creates an area of effect which damages shields and health, but in reality, every enemy will manage to dodge it, rendering it pointless. I'm sure many of you are waiting with bated breath for my outpouring of displeasure regarding the Promethean selection at this stage, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint. I mostly enjoy using them. If I had one big criticism, it would be that their design is quite generic, like the machines wielding them, but personally, I've no qualms about utilising them when playing Halo 4. You could also argue, I suppose, that 343 could have shown a little more ingenuity when coming up with them all in the first place, as it is quite a coincidence that every Forerunner gun essentially mimics a human weapon in the sandbox. 343 did paint themselves into a corner there though. There were always going to be periods spent fighting only Prometheans, and so there definitely needed to be replacements for some of the existing firearms. When the Flood was the third faction, there was no issue. They didn't carry their own weapons, but they carried both human and covenant guns, so you could take your pick. But in 4, that's not the case. If the Prometheans only carried weird and wonderful futuristic weapons, the complaints would have no doubt been that the existing sandbox was being taken away, making a selection like the human set, but with its own quirks, the best all-round option. Being that their original purpose was to combat the Flood, I'd always quietly hoped that we would get to do just that using them one day, but with Infinite introducing new, and I'd say by and large better, Forerunner armament, I'd say that particular dream is now dead in the water. There's so much new stuff introduced during Forerunner to chat about that I've barely had time so far to discuss the level itself. Thankfully, there's been little of note, mostly just bog-standard combat, but I'd be remiss not to mention that this mission features the first signs of one of 343's worst design habits creeping in. I read two more cores on our level. Hit them before you climb all the way up. To enter the first pylon, you have to destroy three shield cores preventing access, and to enter the second, you have to destroy three shield cores preventing access. You'll be completing the same task multiple times within the same area often during Halo 4, and this is the first occasion it really becomes noticeable. A counterpoint might be that Bungie sometimes did similar. Having to use explosives on vents in the engine room during Combat Evolves the Moor is a great example, but it happened far less frequently. The way 343 approaches it drags out encounters and makes proceedings feel very repetitive at times, as the setup is very nearly always the same. You kill some enemies, then press a button and some more spawn in. You press another button or similar, and even more spawn in, and so on and so forth until you're done. It won't have begun to aggravate you quite yet, but give it time. Shutting down the second beam, it appears you're in a race with the Covenant. The Covenant are moving towards the Relay 2. This doesn't make any sense. Why would they care about a broadcast relay? I'll handle them. You just find us that control node. And racing against time to stop the Infinity. How soon till Infinity hits the gravity well? A minute or two max. The Covenant are making a push for something on the far side of the satellite. After killing a few more Covenant dropped off ahead of you, you can choose to proceed through a door on your left or a door on your right. If you only played this mission once, you'd be forgiven for assuming both were the same, but they're not, and I like that. Whichever path you decide on, the environment itself will simply be mirrored, however, the encounters you face will be markedly different. To the left, the first two areas feature face-offs between the Covenant and Prometheans, which the latter have the upper hand in. You can choose to get stuck in immediately or hold back, and if you decide to play a more passive role, you'll likely end up having to clear up any Promethean stragglers. To the right, the Covenant are faring much better, with a Kamak Kazi Phantom wiping out any and all Prometheans for the first encounter, leaving you to fight only a familiar adversary. Similarly, in the second, the Covenant will wipe out your new foe in record time, so again you'll be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with your old enemy. Both have a third segment too, but they're practically identical, which is a tad disappointing. That being said, the idea of split paths containing different challenges is something I can't remember the series really featuring before, although I could be wrong, and it's an excellent addition. No matter whether you choose to go left or right, you'll eventually reach the top and touch two pillars in order to open communications so you can contact the Infinity. It turns out, however, that Chief and Cortana have been tricked. The device in the centre of the room is not a satellite, but rather a cryptum, a forerunner prison of sorts, within which lurks a powerful new nemesis, the Didact, creator of the Prometheans. Even these beasts recognise what you were oblivious to, human. 
Your nobility has blinded you, as ever. The librarian left little to chance, didn't she? Turning my own guardians, my own world, against me. I'll talk about the didact in greater detail when we reach a later point in the campaign, but for now, I'll say that his introduction is a good one. It establishes him as a threat. The cinematography is excellent, an aspect of Halo 4 which is consistently brilliant throughout, and he leaves enough breadcrumbs that you want to find out more, but don't feel overwhelmed, which may well happen a few levels later. After a fall, Master Chief comes to with all hell breaking loose. find a portal out of here before the whole network collapses. I used to think I liked these final few minutes whizzing through canyons aboard a ghost, and I genuinely don't know why I used to think that, because they are terrible. It pains me to say that too, as I usually love a Halo escape sequence, with the Warthog runs at the end of Combat Evolves the More and 3's Halo, both series highlights. With the area descending into chaos, it's time to make a quick escape, a task expedited thanks to Cortana, who uses energy from Chief's shields to overdrive the vehicle's boost. Given everything is crumbling directly ahead of you, boost is something you'll be needing needing to use fairly frequently too. Wonderfully, the Master Chief Collection never let me forget that, thanks to the hint that I could not get to disappear for love nor money, but that is a minor inconvenience in the grand scheme of things. You'll notice that the Ghost's boost bar in the top left no longer depletes, thanks to Cortana's upgrade, and when you use it, pretty yellow trails extend behind you, your peripheral blurs and particles stream towards the screen to signify you moving quickly. It's all a tremendous mess, and what makes it even worse is that when rocks are falling or things are exploding, the screen will violently shake, to the point it's difficult to see what's happening. Let me ask you a question. What do you think you need to be able to do most when you're trying to dodge tumbling boulders while driving at high speeds? That's right, more than perhaps any other time in Halo 4, you need to be able to see clearly. Oh, and because of all the jumps and tight corners, and shaking, it's also very easy to flip your ghost, which makes a restart necessary. I apologise if the sarcasm marinating this particular portion of the video makes for a tough listen, but at the same time, I hope it paints as clear a picture as possible of just how much I loathe this section. It requires an absurd amount of visual clutter to stand out within a game filled with visual clutter, and yet somehow Forerunner's Ghost set piece manages to do just that. Heading through a portal to greener pastures provides a modicum of relief from the overwhelming frustration prior, at least. Chief managing to avoid falling over the edge of a cliff by a hair's breadth is entertaining enough, but this shot of the Infinity reaching Requiem and passing over his head is breathtaking. There's no time to lose either, with the Didact heading exactly where you'd expect as Forerunner draws to a close. You know where he's heading. Same place we are. There is a lot to take in during Forerunner, and I think it's important I try and separate my high-level thoughts regarding certain aspects of Halo 4, the Prometheans, their weapons, and the Didact, from my views of the mission itself. After all, most issues regarding that trio in particular could equally be applied to much of the rest of the game as well. I don't like Forerunner much, honestly. Yes, the new additions are exciting, to begin with at least, but they're attached to an experience which features a lot of busy work, one carried by the multi-faction dust-ups between the Covenant and Prometheans, and a striking environment. The split path towards the end I especially like, and the Didact's reveal is enjoyable, but the ghost sequence which follows is an absolute howler full of baffling visual touches which do not work in the slightest. It's a level which I'd guess splits opinions. Some will enjoy the introduction of lots of new snuff, or have a whale of a time getting stuck into some multi-faction mayhem, and others, like myself, will see it as the point where many of Halo 4's flaws really begin to become prevalent. Whatever your opinion, I reckon there's at least one thing we can all agree on that the ghost escape sequence at the end is a festering pile of nonsense. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls, and Spartans. If you had a good time, do consider liking, subscribing, and sharing your thoughts, and hopefully we'll hang out again soon.